hello everyone. So today I'm going to be giving you an introduction to functional programming and in a pr practical way. So we're going to cover what, it, what being functional means and how it allows us to write clearer, declarative and testable code. So usually functional programming is taught with abstract functional techniques. I'm going to go for a slightly different approach and we're going to talk about um, examples of imperative code and declarative code and how unfunctional code people may have written in the past and how we can translate to a functional style. So in Objective-C, we've commonly used this imperative paradigm style. And in contrast, there's a declarative way to do it. And this gives us a lot of, uh, a lot of easier, more readable code. Uh, lots of new things like functional programming, functional reactive programming, reactive code, code react, and making use of this to make it easier to read and build better stuff. It allows us to describe what we do, not how we do it. So what is it that makes a functional program? What is it that makes a functional function functional? Pro it's programming done with expressions. Uh, usually when you look at functional programming, people will talk about all these different characteristics, such as first class functions, immutable data, reducing, pipelining, recursion, currying, and monads. Well, let's ignore all that. Functional programming is characterized by one thing and one thing only, side effects. It's the absence of side effects. It's where you don't rely on data outside the current function. It doesn't change data that exists outside the current scope. So what is not a function or function? An unfunctional function looks something like this. We have a function which increments a value outside of itself, and it changes the scope. It changes a global state, mutates it. We also have another example. In this case, we're using NS Notification Center instead of a global variable. It's a single turn, and it's affecting, it has a side effect when you call this function. It makes it hard to test. In contrast, we have a function like this, which is a functional function. It has no side effects. It doesn't use mutability. It doesn't use globals, and it's really pure. So one of the building blocks to functional programming is high order functions. Now, you might not know what that is because it's really hard to understand from these three words. Well, a high order function is a function that takes another function's argument or a function that returns a function. So in Swift, everything is a closure, which is an important thing to remember. By this, I mean a function and closures are pretty much identical. So in Objective-C, we haven't had the same thing. Something that you call, like an object that you call, is slightly different in Objective-C. So you have method calling. So here's an object and how you declare a method on it. We use this bracket. We have a dash, et cetera. And you call it with square brackets. This is really common in Objective-C, and it's how you call methods. You can also have functions, which are declared like this. You call them like this. You can also have blocks. There's dozens of ways to declare blocks. I'm sure you've all seen a site like this. <laughs> and you use it somewhat like functions. But in Swift, it's a little simpler. Effectively, you have something that takes a mink, which is a string in this case, and it returns something which is nothing in this case. And this is how you declare it as a constant. And this is how you set that as a block. You can declare it as a function slightly differently. So in this case, we use the funk keyword. But it's clear to remember that you call them exactly the same way. This allows us to do a lot of cool things. We can really interchange them. So here's an example. We have a function called message1. It takes a value, which is a string. Now, what it's going to do is it's going to print hello and then the given value. So in, if you pass in Kyle, it would say hello, Kyle. Let's do that as a variable closure. It's pretty similar. It just looks quite different. But it does pretty much the same thing. Instead of printing hello, it prints hi. Now, let's change what that does. So we can set function2 to function one, because they're the same thing. And then when we call match it's two, it's going to call hello Swift instead of hi Swift. So now I've got that out of the way, let's take a look at functional program by example. I want to use this example based on a group of people, or in this case, two groups. So we have a first group with me and someone else, which is two people, and then a second group, which has three people. So let's take a look at how we figure out how many people are in there. Well, in a traditional way, you do it really imperatively. And it looks something like this. We have an array of 
integers, and we're going to loop over our groups, get the count of that group, and then append it to our array, and then out of that we have an array of two and three. How can we do this in a more declarative functional way? Well, you do something called map, which is a high order function, so it takes a function, and it's a function that transforms a value. So its declaration looks like this. It takes two things. It takes a source and a closure to transform it, and it returns a new set. And the transform closure looks like this. It takes an item, and it can return something of a different type. So how we do this in a functional way? You call map with our group, and in our closure, we're going to just get the count of elements. So then it's going to do the same thing. It's going to return two and three in an array. Now, look at how count elements is declared. It takes a sequence, and it returns an integer. So you might think this is familiar to the transform closure. It takes an item and returns t. Well, they're the same thing, so we can actually just put that in directly. Now we've cut out that closure wrapping it. So we've taken our really imperative example and condensed it into a single line that's really readable and understandable. Now let's do something else. How would we want to order these numbers so we can get the highest number at the start? So we're going to order it descending. So we're going to go from 2 to 3 to 3 to 2. So for this, we can use another higher order function called sorted. Now, this one takes a sequence, and it takes a closure called is ordered before. And it's going to return the sequence in a different order, declared by your closure for ordering. The is ordered before looks a bit like this. It takes a left-hand side, a right-hand side, and returns a ball, which is if it's ordered before the left-hand side or the right side. So let's look at how we use this with sorted. So we have our array of two and three. We're going to call sorted with R an array, and we're going to pass in a closure which takes the left-hand side, right-hand side, and compares that, more than, and returns that result, which is a Boolean. And now we've ordered it three and two. But as I said earlier, everything's a closure, and that even includes operators in Swift. So the more than sign is actually an operator. It takes a left-hand side, a right-hand side, and returns a ball. So this is really great, because we can just put that in directly. So now we can sort our collection with the more an operator, like this. Let's go for a more complicated example. In this case, we're going to build an array from our arrays. So we're going to flatten them. So instead of having an array of two arrays, we're going to have an array of just strings. Now, imperatively, you'd do something like this. You'd create an array of people, which is empty at the moment, and then you're going to iterate over your groups and append all those people to those groups. So the result is you'd have one array of five people. Well, we can use something called reduce, which is another high order function. It's a little bit more complicated and harder to grasp, but let's go through it. So it takes three things and returns one thing. It takes the sequence, similar to map. It takes an initial value, and it takes a closure to combine two values. And then it returns a new value out of the whole thing. Now, let's look at what combine looks like. It takes one value, the initial value in the first case, and value, and returns u, which is a generic type. So let's take a look at how that works. But remember also, plus is an operator. It takes two things and adds them together. In the case of, if you give it a left-hand side with one array and a right-hand side of one array, it's going to add those together, add the elements together inside this, and it's we're going to return the result. So you can use reduce. And what it's going to do is we're going to pass it in groups, which is our two groups of people. Then it's going to have an empty array as the initial value, and then plus. So what this is going to do is it's going to call our closure to combine them, plus in this case, with the left-hand side of our initial value, which is an empty array, and the right-hand side of the first um, group, which is Kyle and Maxine in the earlier example. And then what it's going to do is it's going to take that result and then pass it in on the left-hand side of the next case. So that's going to become the initial value of the next one. And it's going to keep doing that until eventually it's got the end product, and then it's going to return that to reduce. So we can produce this with reduce, with one line. It's really nice. Try and do that in another way. It's much more like code in imperatively. So let's look at another example. We have some kind of input from a server, which is it's all the names separated by a new line and separated by commas. So the new line represents each group, and the comma represents each person in that group. How would we look at passing this? Well, we might do something like this. We could have an array of groups. We're going to like, split, our line by, split our input by a new line. 
take that new line, split that by comma, and then add that into our groups, and then we get the result, which is the two groups we had earlier. Now, if you look at this example, we could use map to make it a little bit simpler. Instead of looping over things, we can just do it with map. But you might have noticed that it would be easier if we had a function which could separate by comma, and then we could get rid of this and just pass that function instead of writing our own closure, right? Like how the plus in the commas work in the previous examples. So if we had a, a function called comma separator, and what it does, it takes an input, separates it, and returns the result. Now what we can do is we can call map with the input, which would be the two groups, um, the group comma separated, and then use the comma separate method, and it would split them out. Well, let's go back to high order functions. You might have noticed that this example showed a really generic, specific comma separator function we built. With high order function, we can have a function that returns a function. So imagine a function called separate by. You give it a character or a string to separate it by, and it's going to return you a new function which can actually do the separation. So in this case, we're going to return a function which can separate by the first thing. So if you use the call separate by and give it a comma, it's going to return a function that could split things by commas. So we can make a line separator function just by calling separate by new line, or a comma separator function by calling separate by comma. Now, we have a thing called currying in Swift, which is you might have noticed there's two brackets around the arguments on the top of this function. So that means it's going to return a function like my previous example, but it's sort of shorthand for doing it. Now, we can, using those two methods, we can actually shorthand our map to somewhat simple like this. So why are map reduced better? Well, first of all, they're declarative. And that means we've written basically one line to declare how everything works in those examples. It goes much on top of our imperative example, where we had like 10 lines of code in some cases. And it gets rid of a lot of mutability. We've never had mutable things in our uh, declarative version makes it easier and simpler to understand the code and readable, because you haven't got to track so many things. And using these higher order function building blocks, it really lets you simplify your logic. So let's don't get over -raise. Instead, use map and use reduce. And write declaratively, not imperatively. Apple has given us a fresh state to rethink how we code. This is a chance to explore new paradigms, such as functional programming and how we can use declarative programming here. Thank you.